Uh, so welcome once again to the ELSIC Autonomy Workshop, day one. Uh, thank you all very much for being here. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so Christina, if you could move on to uh, the next slide. Thank you. Um, so the planning committee, I just want to give a quick shout out to them. They've been amazing over the past several months, uh, planning every last detail of this workshop that you're about to attend. Um, so thank you so much to all the people listed here. They've been absolutely amazing um, in doing their job. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the fall meeting for ELSIC, I don't know if um, uh, Wes or, or Jamie or Brenda, you're on and want to give a quick plug for this, but um, we did want to mention that the fall meeting is happening October 10th and 11th. So if you're part of ELSIC or if you're interested in joining and interested in attending, this will be happening in, uh, in October at uh, Pittsburgh at the Community College of Allegheny County. Um, it'll also be online via Zoom. So it'll be a hybrid meeting. The abstract submission deadline has been extended to August 25th. So if you're interested in doing uh, in submitting an abstract, please do so. Registration is also open. So if you go to that QR code, you'll be able to uh, access all that information there. Next slide, please. Oh, one uh, one quick plug. Very excited. Please. For the, um, do you have the? Uh, I don't know. Not sure if the next slide is October 12th. The transition workshop. We didn't have a, a slide for that okay. one, but by all Sorry. means, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So the, the fall meeting, October 10th and 11th, on the 12th, there will be a transition to commercial lunar services workshop. You can find it. Registration is through the same, uh, the same portal. Um, there'll be no abstracts for that third day. Uh, it's really aimed at bringing, uh, bringing commercial together um, to, to help NASA understand what they need to do to enable uh, commercial and uh, kind of uh, vice versa as well. Um, one interesting sort of hot off the presses um, comment that I'll make is that uh, just last week there was uh, an announcement from DARPA that they'll be funding um, commercial entities to pursue their own um, their own arch uh, architectures. And the announcement for those winners will be uh, at our fall meeting. So looking forward to that. And we'll give you more details on that as it uh, uh, as they come around, and I'll put a link uh, in the chat for those who haven't seen that yet. Thanks, Wes. Uh, awesome, thank you. Uh, so, just for your awareness, and this will be uh, posted on several of the upcoming slides as we have um, breaks and Q and A. But all of the uh, questions and the workshop polls will be going through Slido. Uh, if you've been to an LSIC workshop meeting before, you're probably familiar with this, but please head on over to uh, slido.com and you can input our event code, which is LSIC-autonomy, and the password is 2023 workshop. There's already a poll open. You can scan the top QR code on this slide if you need to get in. Um, and the information is also on our event page, which is the bottom QR code. Uh, the event page has the schedule that we'll be following for the workshop, and it also has a program which has all the abstracts, biographies, and pictures from presenters, panelists, and subject matter experts who will be involved in the workshop today. So please head on over there if you're interested in uh, looking at any of that information. Awesome. Next slide, please. So I guess we wanted to start off talking about um, our objective for the workshop. So our main goal is to just kind of gather the community and exchange ideas on autonomy and identify technology gaps uh, for use cases for establishing a sustainable, uh, sustainable presence on the moon and then using the moon to Mars objectives going further to Mars. <laughs> um, so this workshop here is really about generally gathering, gathering us and gathering ideas and um, kind of figuring out what space autonomy is. Uh, so the purpose of it is it's meant to be a little kind of on the abstract side and just thinking outside the box in terms of space autonomy. So we'll be following a general, um, a general schedule of having a panel um, a panel of three members who will talk about their experiences um, and their 
their ideas of autonomy. And then we'll move to presenters who will have 10 minute presentations, three of them. And then we'll move on to a networking discussion where we'll split out into Zoom breakouts and we'll have everyone kind of come together and give their own ideas. And um, we'll do a, a whole sticky notes thing and, and get everyone's feedback. Um, so this will be split into four different sessions. The first of which will be autonomous systems situational and self-awareness, reasoning and acting. The second one is collaborative systems. The third one is lunar applications and autonomy. And the fourth is challenges and autonomy. So the second two sessions will be tomorrow. So stay tuned for those, um, but we'll, we'll start off strong today. Uh, next slide, please. So I'd like to introduce uh, Kevin Somerville from NASA. He's the Deputy Program Director for Technology Maturation in, um, in STMD over at NASA. And he's going to give us a couple words of introduction for, for the workshop. So I believe he'll be uh, sharing screen. Kevin, if you're on. Um, awesome, thank you do. so much. Bum, bum, bum. Share an entire screen. Let's go with this dude. I'm assuming you can see the screen. Let me go into presentation mode. Come on. Uh, so, yes. Yep. You can see everything perfectly now. You can see my charts? Okay. Fantastic. Uh, so, I'm Kevin Somerville, I'm the Deputy Program Director for Technology Maturation. I'm welcoming you all to this workshop. Um, as a general background, for those of you that are new, we've got NASA's LSII or Lunar Surface Innovation Initiative, and essentially uh, it is an initiative to help NASA bring together industry, academia, and, and other parts of government, right, to, to identify and develop uh, novel capabilities for lunar surface exploration. Uh, there's four little other bullet points in there, um, but essentially, I guess the point that I wanted to get to was that, you know, this workshop that we're in today as part of ELSIC uh, is the public side or the public interface for LSII to engage the community, uh, you. LSII is structured around these six major focus groups. Um, and what you might notice is that there's not a focus group for autonomy and fundamentally that's because autonomy is required to address all of these. Um, for, the, for the envisioned future that we have for lunar surface science and exploration, I think each of these will depend on uh, some level of autonomy um, as, we, as we develop new capabilities, uh, both for robotic and human exploration. Let's see. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, LSIC uh, Lunar Surface Innovation Consortium, it's the public interface for LSII. Uh, it's hosted by APO. They're facilitating this workshop. Um, since 2020, we've had, we have biannual meetings. We've got the six monthly focus groups, which are very active. We've got a tremendous support across uh, uh, the country. Um, and like this workshop here, we've had a number of different workshops, right? So if there are various aspects of it that are interesting to you, uh, we, we wholeheartedly encourage you to uh, support them. Uh, as I mentioned before, since 2020, uh, we've had several, um, I guess we have meetings twice a year uh, with other workshops going on. Since then, we've enjoyed tremendous support from the community. Um, you know, the majority of our, our, our participants are from industry. We've, you know, behind that, we've got, you know, a little over a fourth of our community uh, coming from academia. And then we've got nonprofits, which we're hoping to figure out how to bring in more uh, from that community. Uh, and then we've got non-government, I mean, non-NASA government support. Uh, and they're across um, all of the United States and some of our friendly or friendly partners. Uh, in the last year, NASA's released, I think Pam Millwood presented this in the, in the mid-spring timeframe, the Moon to Mars objectives, which had been in work before that. Um, here's a little QR code if you wanted to go dig into that further. Um, but effectively, it sets the, the blueprint for sustained human presence and exploration throughout the solar system. Uh, and its four primary thrusts or uh, elements are science, transportation, and habitation, infrastructure, and operations. Um, and if you dig through the Moon to Mars objectives, you know, just highlighting the lunar infrastructure goals and objectives, 
you'll see there's a list of, uh, of objectives which you know highlight things like uh, lunar surface power, exploration, navigation, exploration, um, advanced manufacturing. And if you study these charts, oh, I'm not sure why it duplicated. You'll see there's a theme in terms of for long-term science and application and for human uh, oper continuous robotic and human operations, uh, advanced manufacturing autonomous construction capabilities, uh, local, regional, and global surface transport and mobility capabilities. And each of these are highlighted with continuous human presence or continuous human and robotic presence, and even then resilient uh, continuous human robotic lunar presence. Um, so, you know, what these mean is that to, to realize the, I guess, the envisioned future for the moon to Mars architecture and, and lunar science and exploration, you know, autonomy is the most required, right? Um, it will permeate and enable our moon to Mars journey. You see it in all aspects of, of what we deployed to the surface. Uh, to support developing these capabilities, we've got a, a sequence of surface technology demonstrations um, ranging from the science um, pilot, which is Viper, uh, doing volatiles inf investigating polar exploration rover. I think Terry Fong um, might be out in the group, uh, or I'm sure there's somebody out in the group who's working on Viper. But you know, they're demonstrating advanced capabilities in autonomy. Um, we're looking at uh, later lunar demos, which will certainly require autonomy uh, as we demonstrate ex uh, excavation capabilities, as we demonstrate ISRU capabilities. And ultimately, you know, you know, a, a large scale demonstration of an ISRU pilot plant almost certainly have to have some level of autonomy uh, for safe, sustained operations. So here we are uh, looking to gather the community together to exchange ideas. You know, I think Danielle mentioned it earlier, the, uh, exchange ideas on autonomy uh, and identify technology gaps and use cases that will enable our presence on the moon and Mars. So. Thank you for joining us today. That's all that I have, Danielle. Thank you so much, Kevin. Really appreciate you. Um, awesome. So if we just flip back to our slides, I think we'll get started on um, session one. We're two minutes ahead of schedule. Uh, Katina, are you able to share slides again? One second. Mm -hmm. So while we're getting that Sorry. set up, all oh, good. While we're getting that set up, um, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Alhassan Yassin. He will be the facilitator for session one. Um, Al Hassan, are you around and able to? I, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, can. Thank you. Uh, so I'll hand it off to you. Okay. Um, welcome, everyone, and good morning, um, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Um, it's a pleasure to meet you all. Um, I am Dr. Yassin. Uh, uh, I'm from uh, the Applied Physics Laboratory and a lecturer at John Hopkins University. Um, and I lead the autonomy focus group for excavation and construction and extreme access. Um, so I'll start off our first sessions by first introducing the panelists, uh, Rama Chalpapa, Emma Holmans, and Drew Petrisha, Petriska, pardon. Um, and uh, I want to start that conversation. Um, we have specific questions that we want to address. Um, I hope we can we can go a little more in depth on these specific questions, um, but from a from a introduction's perspective, um, and, and then if my if I may ask, um, is it reasonable to allow them to introduce themselves before we go on to the questions? Yes, absolutely. Each panelist is uh, welcome to have uh, three or so minutes to introduce themselves before we get started. Okay. Uh, so please, um, we'll go from uh, left to right on my uh, images if that's okay. So Rama, please go ahead. Rama, you're you're muted. 
two most often used things. You are muted. Can you see my slides? Yeah. All right. Hi. Good morning again. I'm uh, Rama Chalapa. I'm a Bloomberg Distinguished Professor at Hopkins uh, with appointments in um, Electrical and Computer Engineering in the Whiting School of Engineering and uh, BME in School of Medicine. I mostly work in computer vision, uh, of course, data science, machine learning, and uh, AI. I've been doing AI for four decades, I think. So I'm also an interim co-director for the newly announced um, Data Science AI Institute at Johns Hopkins University. You may have seen an announcement from President Ron Daniels a couple of weeks ago. Good to be here. Uh, hello, my name is Emma Holmes, and I am a robotics engineer at the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab. Uh, so I work in the robotics group, and my main research interests include multi-domain heterogeneous robotic teaming and then human-robot teaming. So how can we make robots be better teammates for humans? How can we improve the interactions between humans and robots, etc.? So excited to be here and talk on the panel today. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Andrew Petruska. I'm a professor at Colorado School of Mines. I'm also the director of our robotics uh, graduate program. Um, I'm really interested in uh, robotics in pretty much every flavor, and uh, particularly in autonomy and control um, in, in extreme environments. Uh, brilliant. Uh, nice to have all three panelists. Um, and with that, um, the, the, the questions that uh, we're, we'll start to um, bring up, and I, as I went through these questions, um, a lot of them are near to dear to a lot of the um, stuff that I've been working on. And uh, I see there is a lot of AI, a lot of autonomous systems, autonomy. Um, so I, I really want to, um, if, if it's okay, start the, the question perspective. Uh, and Daniel, we're okay on time, correct? So we can start going through the questions? Yes, we are. Okay, brilliant. Um, so the first question, um, and this is to um, uh, to all panelists. I, I think this is a very uh, good one. Um, and if, if you can say a couple words about it, it will be great. So first question asks, how would you define autonomy in the most generalized um, sense? And keep please keep in mind, um, with regard to the, the lunar surface itself. Whoever is talking is talking very softly or away from a microphone. Can you still hear me or not? There you That's go. That's better. Thanks, Alison. Yes, so, ge for, so just generally, um, how would you define autonomy in the most generalized sense? Um, and this can go to all three panelists. Whoever would like to go first, um, please go ahead. Um, I guess I could go first. Um, so I would, in a general sense, define autonomy to be the ability of a system to perform the tasks required of it with needing minimal supervision. So like for human robot teaming, we might want to have just like very simple commands to get it to perform a task, whereas some completely autonomous systems, all you need to do is input the initial task or mission and then have the understanding that it'll be able to complete that task without any further instruction. I would like to add to that by saying autonomous, an autonomous system should also be able to evolve and be able to learn from additional sensor inputs and so forth so it can handle unexpected scenarios. Yeah, and I think the only thing I would add is, you know, when I think about it from a, a completely general sense, um, I think there's a lot of uh, aspect of approval and the ability to do things without um, first asking for for approval to do the task. And it should also have the ability to evaluate itself, how well it is doing. So, you know, if it is in a ditch, for example, it should know it cannot get out easily and it has to devise other means of getting out. So it seems like the generalized sense, it's physical inherent skills that it would need and in the interaction between the different um, systems and subsystems um, uh, overall effectively. Um, it, it, so I, I think it's really challenging to think about the generalized sense, um, but 
uh, there are things that we can take into account and I, I, I don't necessarily, um, uh, I guess from a, from a general perspective, um, how about with regard to how you address it on space systems, for example, like on the lunar surface? And well, it, again, it, 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 yeah, it has to have some kind of a psychological profile that it is probably alone and there's not a lot of help <laughs> and then how it can cope up with the issue. So that's what I think it's, it's almost like uh, it has to behave like a resident and not a tourist. So I think there's different um, levels of, of, of autonomy, right? I mean, when you think about it from, from a person's perspective, um, you know, you, you can give children autonomy to do certain tasks and then as they prove themselves you can grow your level of of trust in that system and your willingness to let them do things so you know at first maybe we we start off with providing the autonomy to to go from point a to point b and then we start having it do more and more complex tasks um but i think it's about how how do we safely grow our trust in the system and expand its capabilities in a way that we don't uh, end up in a situation we can't recover from yeah, I think there's like that key difference between like automation versus autonomy, like an automated system would most likely just be performing the same thing over and over again, assuming no difference of environment or inputs, but on a, in an environment like the moon, uh, you don't always know what your terrain is going to look like, what kind of scenario you'll end up in. So you need to be able to recover from anything or be able to constantly take in those inputs from whatever sensors you're using. Uh, in order to continually do your tasks. And, and I think that actually aligns well with the next question, which is uh, addressing, in your opinion, um, the difference between autonomy, um, artificial intelligence, and automation. Because um, I think that's, we often mistake these things, um, especially when it comes to AI. When we think about autonomy, somehow AI is intrinsically like there but you can do autonomy without AI. So maybe in, from your own kind of perspectives, how do you, uh, how do you kind of define those three things, the, the AI, autonomy, and uh, automation? So I think, I think for me, like you're saying, like autonomy is generally, I think more of like the manufacturing for, or not autonomy, and automation, you think more of the, the manufacturing for where you have a specific task you're gonna do over and over again, and there's less, environmental disturbances that you might have to adapt to, or at least they're less complex. Um, when I think of uh, autonomy, it's it's the it's the harder problem um, where you have to adapt to new challenges and overcome things that you may, the engineers may not have specifically foreseen and programmed. Uh, when I think about artificial intelligence, I, I see that as more of a tool to help us accomplish those goals, not necessarily um, one thing or the other, but one aspect of the system that would allow it to become autonomous. Yeah, I, I would agree with all of that. I think another thing to add for the difference between like maybe automation versus autonomy and artificial intelligence is the necessity to make decisions. An automated machine does not need to make a decision. It just knows that it needs to do the same thing over and over again consistently. Uh, whereas with an autonomous or um, any system with AI, uh, there's that understanding that depending on its inputs, it'll need to make the best decision on what it needs to do next. Um, so any autonomous system will need to make decisions, but artificial intelligence is one of the ways that it can, it's another tool, um, as Andrew said, that it needs to use in order to make these decisions. The definition, or at least what we understand of AI, has changed over the decades. In the first 20, 30 years, we, we had put big emphasis on domain knowledge uh, and, and so on, searching through various alternatives and finding the best solution, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, these days, we are just uh, doing everything using data. Okay, so um, I think what will happen for an autonomous system to be successful is to be able to cleverly combine domain knowledge and uh, you know data uh, especially when it comes to uh, going to a uh, moon you already will have pre-trained models uh, and then you are sending them over there and then it has to adapt to the new data in in moon i don't know how much data is available to really train uh, and and send the model so being able to adapt and at that time you know domain knowledge is also important so i think that's where ai is is going to be effective uh, by combining these two 
I actually think that's actually very relevant, especially with the, you know, tying this to the lunar surface itself. Um, AI in, in general, um, it, the way that we traditionally do it is a huge data uh, and, 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 and trying to understand and find the patterns in the data. But when you're putting it onto the lunar surface, it becomes very challenging, especially when you don't have that sufficient amount of data. How do you take that into account? And then what kind of misconceptions would arise um, from autonomy, do you think, uh, from a general, like, let's say, public perspective, as we say, oh, we're just going to put robots up there and, you know, we'll let them do what they, whatever they want, they want to do. Um, so w what kind of things arise from a misconception perspective there? Well, iRobot movie is a great example. If people think of an autonomous system, they think it'll go rogue. So hopefully that that is still the misconception and it's not true. So. Yeah, I, I agree with that. It, it's not going to take over, but AI is still just a incredibly powerful tool that gives an edge to whoever is, you know, using or controlling it. Um, so maybe AI will take over, but as it grows and expands, it'll continue to be used as a tool for um, other people to use in order to get what they want. Um, other misconceptions that I've seen in the general public, um, I've seen the two sides of it. So some people again, believe that autonomy is much smarter, better than it is, and it will definitely go rogue. And then on the opposite side, um, some like government officials that I've been giving demos to believe that robots are just these clunky machines that can't do anything that require constant human input or babysitting in order to, uh, to work. But neither of those is necessarily true. There's like, it's in the middle, like, there are some things that robots are very, very good at. And then there are some that humans are definitely better at. So one thing that we like to talk about is the, the dull, dirty, dangerous. So robots are great for doing very dull tasks um, and they're good for doing dangerous tasks, but some of the more difficult tasks, uh, those are the ones that uh, humans are more suited to do. So on yeah, the I, go ahead, please. No, I think uh, Rayma and Emma did a, a fantastic job, and it's hard to follow them, so I'll let you go. <laughs> you know, even recently, uh, a high-ranking person in Air Force kind of made a remark that drones, uh, when they're in the uh, battle, and if they don't like the <laughs> things, and they'll just come and kill the, uh, the person who deployed it or something. And then everybody said, wait, 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 what are you saying? And then he, he withdrew and said, oh, I was just thinking of something, you know. So there is all this, even people who are in the field sometimes tend to over-imagine in terms of what is possible. So I think we have to be careful. Uh, I don't think that's uh, uh, true, but uh, Hollywood movies, uh, right from hell, uh, you know, way back when, right? Uh, create these kinds of uh, interesting, scary scenarios. So we have to watch out for those. Mm -hmm. So I, I think from um, at least the way that you're addressing them, recognizing the pros and cons of the such systems is definitely ideal to address, you know, let's say um, the different problem areas that we care for. Um, as, as you kind of alluded to, they are tools. So then from a autonomy, um, perspective and recognizing their pros and cons. Um, how do you see them being applied to space exploration? What what potential avenues um, uh, could be utilized um, from from what we understand of autonomous systems? Like for example, so uh, I think on spacecrafts or something. So I'll jump in and and I'll and I'll kind of end where where Emma left off there with the idea that there's you have the misconception on one side that's robots are going to take over the world, but then you have the other misconception that robots are much less capable than than they could be. Um, and I think, you know, when you think about why is that misconception there, especially in our government, it's because when they look at a lot of the current autonomous systems that we have deployed, they do require rooms full of people to monitor and control. And there is very little autonomy when you're looking at, you know, the, the motion of a, of a robot on an extraterrestrial surface. And I think as we as we go forward and we make more capable systems and we get um, different hardware out there, we can start to offload some of the the minutia of the driving around and how we get around obstacles, how we get to certain positions, and we start to reduce the number of people that require to be in the room that'll start to change opinions on the on the government side on what it takes. 
Uh, my worry is uh, computer vision has totally is, is totally being dominated by deep learning. And deep learning works well when you have the right type of data, right quality of data. So that is going to uh, decide how successful um, you know these algorithms or systems based on deep learning will operate uh, in, in a data poor situation because we need annotations so somebody has to take care of that the other thing i worry about that gpus really uh, kill batteries so how, how are we going to maintain a continuously running computer vision system uh, that runs on deep learning because that's all we do these days. We don't do anything else, and and most GPU servers are uh, you know tethered to power big powerful uh, you know energy sources. So after a five a half an hour, will the robots say, "Oh my God, I can't process anything. I don't have any power." So that I think is a worrisome. Edge computing is talked about, but you know you can you know the, the, I don't know how that's all going to work out. So for me. Computer vision by betting everything on deep learning is making it very difficult for autonomous systems that rely on computer vision to work on, on the moon because power is a big, big challenge. Yeah, uh, pulling kind of that same thread, um, like the issue of swap is incredibly important for space systems. You need to have a very lightweight system that is able to last a long time, uh, just depending on um, how often it's able to see the sun and recharge, or um, on something like the, the moon or Mars, if uh, your solar panels get uh, too dusty, you, your, uh, your efficiency is going to go down with respect to collecting energy. Um, so when you have these very uh, low swap machines that you need, um, you also want them to be almost a, a multi-tool so that you only have to send up a few at a time. So something like the, the Mars rovers, they're basically giant rolling multi-tools. But with uh, these incredibly complex machines, there are more ways that they can fail. Um, so incredibly co uh, complex uh, mechanical systems. Um, that's why they require so much more um, like babysitting behind the scenes um, in these rooms full of people. Um, just be uh, being able to monitor each system, make sure that, that everything is okay, and then being able to step in immediately if there are any anomalies. So having these complex systems be completely autonomous on something like the moon and Mars might be a bit more difficult, but getting more towards the semi-autonomy, I think is much more manageable. So being able to give maybe higher level commands and understanding that the robot will be able to drive where it needs to and be able to um, recover from maybe just a small bump in the road or being able to like drive around a small crater, but having a robot make those like uh, other decisions about like which rock it should go towards or like which thing it needs to take a sample. Um, since these machines will need to uh, kind of maximize um, what they do in that short amount of time that they're able to be powered. Um, maybe artificial intelligence will be able to help make those decisions, or maybe it's just something that we want to keep on the human side so that humans can have their priorities on what they want the robot to do. Um, but in summary, I think keeping more of a, a semi-autonomous or not fully autonomous uh, system would be the next step. I I do agree. I think in the beginning it it it, it is going to happen that way. Um, so from a perspective of um, limitations of let's say operations, I mean eventually you get to a state where initially it's human and then humans operating and then looking at these autonomous systems, but eventually you get to a state where they're fully autonomous, where it's not um, a human present it's more likely that way um can, maybe can you like what are the modern operations that we could potentially utilize or, or do in those different levels that you you know initially it's going to be a human in the present as as the systems uh, go about and then eventually going into completely fully autonomous can you maybe allude to some of that uh, human AI interaction is, is an evolving topic as you know human computer interaction has been around for four decades um, it's uh, this is a complex uh, subject because 
we don't know exactly how to model uh, the trustworthiness of AI systems yet. And humans have to develop a trust by continuously working with the AI by their side and, and, and understand the quirky uh, nature of the artificial intelligence system. So this is a pretty interesting issue. And I would like to point to weekly notes from one of my dear friends at University of Maryland, uh, Ben Schneiderman. Every week he puts out a note on human AI uh, you know, issues and so forth. It's a delightful thing to read. It's a short one. So please uh, get yourself on that uh, email list uh, you know, from Ben Schneiderman. Uh, I, I think uh, we, I do a lot of work with uh, doctors at Hopkins. So the first question is, how do we handle in, in the future that the triplet, the human, uh, the patient, the doctor, and the AI? Because AI is going to be integrated into medicine. It's already happening. And maybe 10 years from now, you will see a board saying AI is at work here in a hospital. So how that's going to work out, how the patient will trust what the doctor says versus what the AI says and how they combine uh, give better decisions. So human AI thing is going to be important uh, field and it's definitely relevant uh, here because Moon is a resource uh, challenged uh, place from uh, what I have seen. So I think, I think please go. go ahead, please. No, no, it's okay. Please go. I was going to say, you know, I, I kind of switching perspectives. I think that, you know, when I think about AI and autonomy coming into these systems, especially on the on the interface between people doing the tasks to people controlling the machines to to people watching machines do the work, um, I think there's an aspect of of you know letting the letting the scientists and letting the engineers focus on what they are experts on, and and trying to move the the machines and the and the robots to be able to do the tasks that don't don't truly require the the flexibility and the reasoning capability of, of the person so that the in the medical case the surgeon can worry about curing disease um, instead of exactly how to do the suturing or uh, or in or in the lunar perspective we can have the scientists figuring out exactly where the sampling should be taken or what rocks they're particularly interested in from a from a you know materials perspective what have you um, instead of trying to figure out exactly is there a crater there I need to drive around yeah, I think just understanding the capabilities of the system is the best way for you to have trust between, you know, the scientist or the user and the the autonomous system. So understanding what the autonomous system is good at and then letting it do its job. Um, and then that also frees up the mental load on the human user side so that they can focus on whatever they need to do. So then from a design's perspective, um... Is it limited on what we can potentially conceive of them or, or problems that we, we allow them to explore? Are there capabilities that are outside of that perspective? Can we develop such things um, where, you know, as you kind of alluded to, when you're on the moon, for example, you can't take everything into account, right? Like our limitations are what we can conceive of that that is present, let's say there. Or is there maybe areas where they could potentially think outside of our the design operations that we, we we allowed them I think maybe eventually that that adapting to situations for which the engineers didn't foresee is, is something that could happen but I think initially when we're thinking about um, how reliable the system is and whether or not we trust the system especially on data driven systems outliers are always uh, question mark areas um, I think it would be more more important to make sure that we bring in the people at that point when we have encountered a novel situation that the robot hasn't been, you know, versed in. Just as just as if you're thinking going back to the medical world, if you have a, a, a medical person being in training, if they come into a novel situation, you want to have a more senior person in the room that can provide comments on the best way to alleviate that particular issue, right? So they have to have guidance. And I think from a robotics perspective on the moon or or anywhere, if, if there is a novel situation, you probably, at first, until we get much more robust tools, you need to have somebody that can come in and provide that guidance. Yeah, I think more and more, you know, 30 years ago, we had two kinds of learning, supervised, unsupervised. Uh, these days, we have a whole spectrum in the learning axis, uh, weekly supervised, semi-supervised, self-supervised, and so on. So we have to have the robot be able to 
uh, learn by as it collects more data and more, uh, you know, uh, and so forth. Just try to update its state of mind, so to speak. Uh, that's the only way it can survive in a tough uh, place, right? So self-supervised learning is where we have to uh, put some emphasis on if the robot has to survive on the moon. So then what, what are the most important, let's say, breakthroughs we need um, from autonomous systems? Um, for example, energy sensing, actual compute software. Yeah. What, what uh, do you perceive? Well, uh, being able to do with very little uh, computing. So in the sense, learning from small data, small samples is, is very important. So it should not continuously rely on getting more and more data. So we have to develop methods that can do well from small data. We call it few shot learning in computer vision. So we need to develop that. And also we need to do a lot of OODs, out of distribution detection. The, the robot has to know, well, this is not something I've, I've seen before, so what is it? And then it kind of has to be able to collect whatever data is needed to kind of cope up with it, right? So it's, uh, um, yeah, so that those are the things we need to know. Surprises, uh, being able to detect uh, things that have not been modeled before and then how to uh, proactively collect additional information so it can overcome that. Um, and so on. Those are the, you know, the learning, adapting is is very important as part of learning, right? So if that's the, so we have to have put those sorts of uh, abilities in, in robots. Yeah, I agree with that completely. Just speaking from experience, uh, needing to collect data for, for example, like an aerial vehicle uh, that needs to do object detection, there's a lot of data that exists for uh, looking at an object from the ground level and looking straight at it, but not a lot of data from an aerial perspective or an eagle eye view looking down. So needing to collect all of that data in order to do uh, like object detection training on uh, just takes a lot of time, just on our side for the data collection, uh, the data labeling, and then the training itself. And then there's no guarantee that you're going to end up with a, a good model at the end of it. Um, so being able to develop few or uh, zero shot learning um, in order to allow the uh, robots to be able to see things from either new perspectives or just completely new objects uh, would be you know, a game changer. Um, and then additionally, from a pure mechanical point of view, um, just increasing um, like overall swap. So being able to uh, have smaller, more powerful batteries, um, like that would be huge, uh, both to increase runtime for robots, being able to decrease their size. Um, and then again, being able to use um, GPU capabilities without completely draining the system, like all of those would be huge in the, the robotics world. I agree with it. I agree with both all those comments. I think the only thing I would add um, to this from a more like general autonomy perspective, what do we need to do? I think when I think about how people operate in unknown environments, we have we kind of have this this supervisory perspective that allows us to um, estimate both both risk and confidence. So how risky is an action that we might take and how confident are we that we can execute on that action? And I think having, you know, trying, getting to a point where an autonomous system can can evaluate for its sequence of actions, both the, both the the risk of that sequence and the and the confidence in execution on that sequence based on prior successes or what have you, um, would go a long way to to being able to provide trust and then also be able to identify and alert uh, for assistance when, when assistance becomes required because the risk is too high or the confidence is too low or the combination is poor. Um, so I think beyond just computer vision, I think we need to develop that for the, for the actual actions that the robot's taking. So then maybe can we allude to a little more on, let's say the specific roles of teleoperations versus, versus let's say fully autonomous robots for different space exploration activities? Maybe can you allude to oh, like break that down a little more? I, I think you know teleoperation is a great solution in in general, but it breaks down as the time of flight to get information back and forth becomes exceedingly long. I mean, at some level, once we start wanting to do something you know out of line of sight of the earth or where communications aren't available or when communications take you know 15, 20, 30, 40 minutes, an hour, two hours, right? You no longer 
can reasonably teleoperate. And so then you start to have to to shift to a more autonomous system where you're providing goals and waypoints and you're waiting for feedback. Um, I think that's going to, to force the issue, honestly. I, I think we have, I don't know, I've not kept track of what's happening on the uh, surface of the moon or with the lunar expeditions and so on. Although I'm eagerly waiting to see what's going to happen to the Indian uh, thing that's going to land apparently on Wednesday. So, you know, as we can see, the Russian thing kind of uh, failed. And so even just landing onto moon looks like still not a completely perfect uh, operation. Uh, so having, and after saying that, I think uh, what I would like to have first done is map as much of uh, lunar surface as possible and then design safe corridors, you know, have some highways uh, where, you know, robots can automatically go here and there and not get into trouble and find those kinds of, uh, I don't know if they're still, uh, they're already there. As I said, I have not kept track of these things since 19, 1969 uh, landing. Anyway, so I think mapping, uh, you know, if we are able to do that and then decide uh, where a robot can go and then have little, little communities here and there, and then maybe uh, slowly we can develop the idea of safe uh, passage. Because my concern is it probably will go somewhere in a crater and not get out, right? I don't know how deep the different craters are. So just providing the ability to go around itself is very important to give some autonomy. And then we can start building from there. Is there is there a mapping available to a reasonable extent? Uh, I keep hearing of certain regions where you know people have looked at, but not uh, uh, in a wide way. How how challenging is that? Can somebody address that? Are you asking about mapping from orbit or mapping, uh, you know, from uh, surface assets? Yeah, so, yeah, sir. I want to send a robot that the role is just to go and, and and map and then kind of figure out where everything is, you know, over a period of time. So we have a good understanding of passable corridors. Uh, and then we can start putting some landmarks and things like that. So landmark guided navigation, because if it gets lost, it's it's going to be, you know, wandering around. I think there's a uh, huge precedence for this on Earth, of course. Um, I mean, that's enabled so much um, yeah. mm -hmm. infrastructure and capabilities to our vehicles. It, it is actually uh, appreciated probably, uh, but there's been a huge, huge investment um, by, by industry uh, as well in that yeah. area. And so it's, it's very, um, I think, uh, um, practical. Yeah, even Mr. having Smith. it mapped down to, um, maybe like five, 10 centimeters would be incredibly useful. Yeah. Um, and then from a teleop point of view, like using something like model predictive control, where you can, you have your entire system modeled, you can input what you would like the robot to do see in simulation what it would end up doing, especially if you have the area maps, so you'd be able to see where it would end up. And then if you like where it ends up, press go and then um, have reasonable confidence that it'll end up where you had wanted it to go based off of the simulation. Um, that is one way that like, even at like APL, we've been developing uh, ways to do um, robotic control with like high latency, high time uh, delay. Um, so that's one way that it could be done, but having things mapped out so that the robot can continue to make its own decisions would, of course, be incredibly useful. So, so then, I mean, we talk about like maybe highways or monuments or things that it references off of, let's say, the robot um, or, or sub robots or systems. So then in the beginning, effectively in in terrains that it's never seen before as as we you know l allude to like continuously learn to or adapt to the situation do you foresee that potentially a human and a, a robot president to try to figure out these very complicated behaviors initially and then as you get let's say more uh more able like highways or, or, or things that are safer for other robots to do that becomes fully autonomous you don't need a human to kind of tell yeah it. I think that's a good idea. I think humans can help to uh, initialize things. Um, you know, it will be more uh, accurate and and so on. And then the once we set up the the, the safe way to move around and so forth, uh, then other tasks can be focused on. But right now we need to kind of be able to do that. 
uh, otherwise you know it's it's going to be <laughs> wandering around and get lost or, or it'll just stay very local so it won't be able to explore uh, further I, I when i think about train relative navigation on the moon one of the the concerns that i have is relative to the non diffuse lighting conditions and that depending on the the relative locations of things the shadows are completely black and the the surfaces are very bright and the the relative shapes of the the ranges that you're looking at may not maintain the same kind of uh, consistency from the perspective of the camera as they do on earth in a more diffuse setting so i think you know there's some there's some interesting challenges there that we're going to need to to overcome when we try to to map what we do on earth from a train relative navigation and other aspects to the lunar surface but i think there's definitely a path one that will be fought yeah, with that's, learning that's why i keep harping on domain shift <laughs> because even uh, you know in simple change of sensors can sometimes drop the uh, reduce the performance of computer vision algorithms we have seen you change a the camera then you have to retrain fine tune and things like that so when you do the preloaded uh, pre-trained models and uh, uh, send them over to uh, moon, uh, you know, you're definitely going to see a drop in performance. So more and more, uh, there is research on uh, how to start off with large pre-trained models, uh, and then you know how to tune them for multiple tasks and so forth. So this is uh, some going on in vision and NLP and so forth. So it, that's important. Domain shift is is a killer because we depend so much on data. When the way the data comes changes, the performance is uh, not great. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so it, uh, another work. aspect. Oh, go ahead, Andrew. Another aspect is infrastructure and um, things like passive uh, fiducials, something like RFID, whether that be uh, deemed um, acceptable to leave those uh, along these routes um, could certainly help uh, make a system, a vision based system, more robust if we could uh, use something like that um, that is more repeatable. Um, and, and less um, susceptible to uh, environmental changes as we go. Yeah, so uh, I think we are getting to a, a close looks like, but the one thing that really disappointed me, you know, as getting ready for this panel is that uh, it's hard to fly <laughs> on, on the moon. Uh, and a and lot of work I did with UAVs, uh, they're not going to be very useful. It's, so, uh, Right, uh, we have done, I mean, Emma talked about uh, you have ground level things and what do you do for aerial? And so we had many, many DARPA programs over decades. We have done, you know, MAV, UAV based object detection, tracking the confirmation of objects and everything. So I, I just looked at what's possible. Let's say there's no air <laughs> on the moon. Again, I may be very uh, naive, as I said, uh, you know, I'll, let me just give a personal story. I decided to become an engineer after listening to 1969 landing on the moon. So moon has always been something uh, very, uh, I've been fond of it. Uh, but is there any way uh, other than uh, ground-based things, other kinds of modalities are possible? And what would that be? Are it just simply impossible to have a little drone flying around moon in any way? I mean, I'm, I'm maybe asking a stupid question, but that's okay. I mean, you I, can do it. It requires rockets and stuff. But I think Emma had a a, a comment she wanted to make. Oh, but I was going to comment a little bit more on uh, sensing capabilities. So I've been doing some work in underwater perception and underwater robotics. And um, things like cameras or LIDAR don't work as well underwater, but sonar does. But unfortunately, because of the lack of air up in space, sonar doesn't work in space. So it's it's a lot of just like looking at uh, what domain you're in and what capabilities you could potentially have on those robots. So visually based uh, sensors would work on the moon, but like Andrew had said previously, it would probably take a lot of retraining or at least filtering of the data in order to see uh, beyond like what some of the shadows are are showing. Um, so I, I think, from a perspective of, um, and, and, and and please, there's a lot of questions in the chat. If you get a chance, um, so we're wrapping up. If you get a chance, uh, panelists, please um, try to answer some of those. I think they're very brilliant ones. I like the ones about jumping on the moon and the <laughs> ISRU propulsion-based hoppers. So there's a lot of potential areas or even like having collaborative 
other maybe satellites and 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 uh, rovers together in some capacity. Um, but with that said, um, I really appreciate um, uh, your presence um, here and 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 the conversation. I think it's a really brilliant uh, conversation. And and if there are more questions that maybe weren't addressed, um, please put them in the slide. That we will make sure to send those out to the panelists um, as as they. Um, as as they get more time, I, I hope you can answer some of those questions in the Slido. Um, uh, that would be, that would be phenomenal. And and then with that said, we are on the uh, on time right now. So thank you so much for um, the first session. Um, and I'll let the next uh, speaker um, come up. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, so I think we have some uh, a break right now. Um, so yeah, yeah. So a quick coffee break, just 10 minutes. We'll see you all back here at 11.05. There is a poll open in Slido. Um, it's different from the one uh, that has been out for now. So we'll have a different poll, different like single question during each break. So if you're able to hop on and answer that during your quick coffee break, please go ahead. Uh, thanks everyone and we'll see you back in a second. Uh, thank you for, I hope you had a good coffee break. Um, uh, Dr. Yasin, just a reminder to speak into your mic. Better? I'm, I'm, I'm like yelling at my mic by this point. <laughs> you have a very um, soft voice. Thank you, thank you. Your your words are very kind. Um, so I would like to uh, introduce the our two speakers, Alex and Ben from Astrobotic. Um, the, you're based in Pittsburgh, correct? Yep, that's right. Very cool. I actually grew up in Pittsburgh too, so that's this is very fortunate that uh, we're that way. Anyways, um, so uh, they'll be presenting the future of precision lunar localization. Um, with that said, um, introductions and going into your um, conversation would be phenomenal. Um, and we'll get started. So you have as much time as you can. And please uh, feel free to put questions into the chat in Slido. And we'll also have time for uh, questions as well towards um, the end of the conversation. Uh, but please uh, start. Are, are you guys okay to share screen or would you like us to? Yes, yeah, I can share my screen. Awesome, thanks. Whoops. Go back here. All right, do you see the DC slides? Yes, thank you. Okay, awesome. All right, well, thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is Alex Plata, joined here with Benjamin Yunus. Uh, as mentioned, we're both um, working at Astrobotic as flight software engineers. And today we'll be talking about the future of precision localization. Uh, we'll also be presenting a short case study on some work that we did, some graduate student work that we did at Carnegie Mellon under direction from Red Whitaker. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about lo where localization is today, both on Earth and off Earth, and then some of the core challenges as they relate to the lunar environment specifically, some promising modalities um, for sensors and other infrastructures, and then how those can accelerate autonomy development for the future, uh, as we've kind of been talking about today. And then we'll wrap up with some key technology activities to, to do those developments, at least recommendations from our standpoint. So at a really high level, um, localization um, boil, can be boiled down to estimating accurately a system's um, state relative to some other kind of data, whether it be something that's local, like within a work site or relative to a lander or more global on a planetary body. And the accuracy of this state uh, estimate is really underpinned by the accuracy of measuring the state itself and also in, in interpreting the environment around the system. And this can be especially challenging in lunar environments and even more so on the pole. And so uh, localization on Earth um, is really leveraging a lot of very high compute and power systems, which are nearly unlimited, as well as billions of dollars of investment in existing infrastructure and in GPS or things like robotic total stations, 
Um, in self-driving cars, you see entire maps of entire cities. Um, these are oftentimes dynamic environments as well, and the machines are uh, able to be accessed a lot of times by people if things go wrong. In contrast, in planetary exploration, a lot of the, the localization systems that we've seen have been for on the scale of uh, tens of meters of uncertainty ellipses where robots are navigating on long traversals and relatively um, desolate environments with little to no infrastructure at all, all while using um, highly limited compute and sensing um, in order to survive the, the different environments. Um, and so uh, as we move forward into the um, lunar surface autonomy that we talk about today, um, we'll need to make sure that we're um, combining aspects of those in intelligent ways. On the lunar surface specifically, um, it's even harder because of challenges due to lighting and dust. And with lighting, looking up sun or down sun can wash out a lot of the features that many algorithms require to, um, to combine um, estimates into an overall localization um, system. Uh, similarly with dust, the dust as it gets kicked up can cover the sensors themselves or even cover other features in the environment. And this will be especially relevant in uh, areas where robots are operating in a sustained um, work site and kicking up that dust as they do different construction activities. Additionally, these constraints are really hard to replicate on Earth, um, which is something that we'll need a lot of data and test beds for that we'll talk about going forward. And so there's a lot of the sensing modalities that have in many ways been tested out in other existing um, other, other missions but oftentimes in a more limited sense. There's a lot of vision algorithms and sensing modalities that could be really high, uh, high potential for things like crater detection and more, as well as SLAM approaches, but a lot of these are really compute intensive. Um, structured light and LIDAR are what could be great ways of being less um, brittle to variations in lighting conditions for uh, short term and long, for short distance and long distance measurements respectively. Um, but again, they have some of their own like power and uh, TRL development challenges. Fixed assets could provide a really great way to extend from a per mission uh, localization system and build out something more as, as like the position navigation and timing architecture that we talked about in some of the lunar, girl, lunar surface goals. Um, things like radio beacons and uh, passive and active visual fiducials could be really powerful as could laser range finders. Um, also called total stations, which are extremely precise. They off, offload a lot of the onboard compute the systems and are very robust to dust and lighting conditions. So this will be kind of the focus of the case study that, we'll, uh, that Ben will be talking about in a moment here. Um, there's also lots of opportunity for um, orbital assets like GPS, but these will be much um, more of an investment to, to establish, but could also be maybe more easily accessible to a variety of different, um, different systems. Um, and I'll... My slides are loading. I'll pass it off to Ben to talk about that case study. Awesome. Thanks, Alex. Um, so let's say you're on the moon um, and um, you're trying to get stuff done on the lunar surface. So you might have some rectangular or circular areas which you want to control um, like topography on. So you might want to make a um, like maybe a landing pad or maybe a road or a parking lot um, or even some area to build um, um, service infrastructure on top of. Um, so you have a lot of different options um, um, when you're talking about localization. Um, one of the ones that we wanted to highlight was uh, using a robotic total station, um, which is basically um, uh, laser ranging um, for uh, local precise localization. So you're trying to work within this work site, you're trying to cut, you're trying to fill, you're trying to compact or trench or um, install pilings, whatever you're doing, um, you're gonna need to know where you are in this work site. So just as a diagram, Alex, um, if you go to the next slide, um, if you are this robotic cube and you're trying to do something useful um, on the lunar surface, um, if you have a, that cylinder there um, providing you um, full X, Y, Z, um, position down to the millimeter, um, it can be super useful as you're navigating around this work site. Um, and uh, this not only lets you know where you are in relation to the work site, lets you know where you um, are in relation to other surface assets, whether it's chargers, um, whether it's keep out zones, um, um, or uh, other useful uh, data comes for free, like slip, 
um, and uh, embedding detection and other things like that um, from such a precise uh, um, localization estimate. Um, and what's great about this is if you do have that cylinder um, providing you, you know, laser ranging uh, data, um, it could be mobile. Um, um, so as long as you have access to three or more control points, um, these are really just prisms. They're just dumb prisms in the ground. Um, as long as you have line of sight to three or more control points, um, uh, you can move that cylinder around um, anywhere. Um, and you can chain these control points together to um, basically do extremely precise localization over long distances. Um, and like I was mentioning, this is, um, you can throw this on any modality. So dosing, grading, compacting, scraping, whatever you want to do. Um, science, uh, it's all pretty much for free. Um, so um, we looked at this um, when we were working with uh, uh, Red Whitaker, uh, Carnegie Mellon, um, when me and Alex were grad students, and we used uh, this robotic total station approach um, to do localization to try and um, uh, modify uh, uh, lunar-like terrain. Um, so the goal was start with some unstructured terrain, um, go and perceive the terrain, um, upload some desired site map to the vehicle, and then let the vehicle um, do the, all, all of the uh, desired um, controls, estimation, mapping, et cetera. Um, and we did some really cool uh, optimization-based material planning to figure out where material gets pushed. Um, but uh, ultimately, what we're highlighting here today is uh, uh, this uh, site-wide uh, millimeter precision in XYZ. And you can also get roll, pitch, and yaw from this as well if you do some initialization. Um, but XYZ is the most um, precise. Um, and uh, yeah, we played around with a lot of different sensing modalities and really um, the, the total station was like the nail in the coffin. It just, it just completely um, uh, outperformed every expectation. And what that allowed us to do when we're talking about robots working in local areas, especially in lunar contexts, is um, uh, it allowed us to make assumptions in other subsystems and really um, robustify things. So um, it was awesome. And you can see in the bottom there the visualization of um, the crater getting filled by a robot um, as we're traversing around the crater there. Um, and next slide, I'll show a quick video. Um, we won't play the whole thing. Um, we'll kind of skip to section here. But uh, here our vehicle is um, uh, kind of just driving around our like 500 square foot um, play sand, um, uh, lunar lake uh, test bed. Uh, that, that's sort of a joke. Um, and you can see uh, in the bottom left uh, video there, uh, the total station tracking um, the uh, retroreflective prism. Um, on the remote sensing mast, um, uh, giving us positional data to our robot. Um, on the right and the left video, um, or sorry, on the on the two right videos, top and bottom, you can see um, the, the the vehicle's view from the remote sensing mast, and then a view underneath the vehicle um, as we have this uh, blade autonomously moving up and down. Um, and you can see some visualization in the top corner there. Um, but the idea was hey, we want to prepare this site, so let's start with a crater and see if we can flatten um, a crater with roughly the, um, uh, with a depth to diameter ratio that makes sense uh, on a length scale that's possible for like a 20 minute demo here. So um, we were um, able to- um, Sorry, about one minute left, sorry. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, we were able to, uh, to demo that technology with the robotic total station pretty effectively. Um, so talking about localization tomorrow, there's lots of awesome upcoming missions that are demoing like uh, multiple uh, surface assets. Um, we're gonna have to work in proximity to landers and other surface assets. Um, we're gonna have to fuse sensing from many different robots together um, and work alongside humans and other surface assets um, as autonomy starts to evolve on the moon. Um, and last slide, I'll just talk about um, things that uh, would enable this um, in the future. So um, lighting data sets from flight and from simulation uh, building large-scale test beds, which allow us to do uh, lunar-like lighting, um, technology-specific pathfinders for some um, promising modalities, and then creating the autonomy-like shelf for uh, uh, lunar autonomy is going to be awesome. Um, and uh, yeah, that pretty much wraps it up. Thanks for uh, listening to our talk. Thank you.
Thank you guys so much. Um, it was a fantastic talk. And uh, I'd like to redirect any questions that you may have to the Slido. We'll have a group Q&A question um, after all of the presenters have gone. Uh, thank you guys so much. Awesome. <clears throat> thank you. I'll uh, stop sharing here. Uh, you. Just a quick uh, shout out. Um, uh, we want to mention that Astro Robotic, which is connected with to the Moon uh, Moonshot Museum, will be part of the LSIC fall meeting. Uh, so tours to Astro Robotic and the Moonshot Museum will be in Pittsburgh, are free and within walking distance from the meeting itself. Um, so please definitely check that out um, during our fall meeting itself. Thank you. Um, all right, just moving on to uh, our next presenter. Hopefully, maybe we can get this up. Um, so next presentation is from uh, Fernando Figueroa. Uh, hopefully I pronounced that correctly. I'm so sorry if I didn't. Uh, are you Are you online? Perhaps not. OK, uh, while we figure out some of those technical difficulties, uh, we will move to Jim Bellingham. Are you online for your presentation? Yes, I am. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So uh, Jim is coming to us from Johns Hopkins University, and he'll be presenting on autonomous systems, humans, and reliability. So I'll let you uh, share screen and take it away. Sure. Let's see. There we go. And project. So I assume you can hear me and see my screen now? Uh, yes, looks great. Okay, fabulous. So, uh, so I, I had the Institute for Assured Autonomy, uh, which uh, bridges the uh, Applied Physics Lab and the Johns Hopkins uh, Whiting School of Engineering campuses. And so I'm going to be talking uh, just very briefly about some intersections between activities that we have going on in other domains uh, and as it relates to space. Uh, and finally, just mentioning that we are actually hiring uh, faculty members in, uh, in the space domain for, uh, for autonomy assurance. I'll, I'll just say, by the way, that, uh, that my background is actually marine robotics. So I, I come at this from the perspective of somebody who's operated uh, systems uh, in hostile environments, uh, just not space. Uh, spent about a year of my life at sea at various points. So first of all, this whole joint venture activity between the Applied Physics Lab uh, and the Whiting School, uh, what is that all about? Well, it, it turns out that, uh, that there's a, a lot of, of course, basic research going on on the academic campus uh, that connects across to, uh, to important problems that, uh, that both need to be done for the nation and which uh, the Applied Physics Lab has specific skill sets. Uh, uh, for carrying out in a, uh, a more engineered sense, if you will. And a couple of examples are right here. Um, the COVID portal started on the academic campus uh, really as a graduate student project and uh, eventually became sort of our window on COVID. Uh, that was hardened by the Applied Physics Lab and really turned into a portal uh, and data sets that the world relied on through there. And then the Parker Solar Pro uh, Probe depended on materials that came out of uh, uh, a laboratory on the academic campus, but uh, obviously turned into a spacecraft, which uh, right now is out there uh, doing amazing things right next to the sun. Uh, I've been at the I've been at Johns Hopkins for two years, and in the process of uh, learning this uh, fabulous uh, academic environment, one of the things that I've be become familiar with, of course, is the medical school. And uh, Rama mentioned this, and I'll touch on it again, but there's a lot to learn from autonomy in the medical domain uh, that I think applies uh, to the space domain. And I'll just say that in the process of working with those folks, uh, I discovered the mental health uh, group, and it turns out there's some fabulous work going on in this domain, 
uh, that that uh, relates to the interaction of autonomous systems and humans as well. And I'll touch on that. So first of all, uh, let's just talk about uh, you know kind of the, the the area that most of us will would read about in the newspaper every every day, uh, uh, which relates to assurance of autonomy, and that has to do with the advent of autonomous cars. Um, you can see that in this domain, the the assurance problem is really kind of the central problem that they're dealing with. Uh, it's the highest cost aspect of their development. Uh, it's the bottleneck, really, in moving this from uh, the laboratory to the market. And there was this marvelous little study done by Rand where they looked at how many uh, miles of driving would it take to really demonstrate statistically that an autonomous car is better than a human in terms of avoiding fatalities. And the number they came to was close to a billion miles. Um, so the problem is, is, is assurance if you don't have... A, if you don't have clever ways of testing it, it can become uh, this intractable problem. And, and, and we can see in the autonomous car world, uh, the cost of that. Uh, if you don't get that right, uh, in fact, uh, these vehicles have enormous problems as you begin to put them on the roads, largely because of the numerous edge cases. So um, how do you think about this? Well, one way to think about the autonomous car is, is a completely self-reliant vehicle. You put it on the road, it has perhaps maps, but it depends on its sensors to, de to, to determine what's going on in its immediate vicinity. Down at the lower right-hand corner, you could imagine an environment where this autonomous car is networked into the environment around it. It's talking to other cars which are on the road. And so as a consequence, it has much more information at its disposal. Of course, it's dependent on that communication and the network, but it can see around the corner. It knows what the car next to it is going to do. And in between, I'll just say that, uh, that we have some autonomous vehicles. Uh, we're actually operating them at the Applied Physics Lab uh, campus, uh, and those are providing test beds for us for experimenting uh, between those two continuums. Uh, these 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 two different endpoints, I think, relate heavily to a wide variety of uh, environments. I'm very familiar with a fully autonomous platform from the ocean environment where communication is, uh, 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 is uh, usually not available. Uh, and here at Johns Hopkins, uh, this pervasively sensed environment uh, for me is increasingly focusing on the operating room where we work with the Armstrong Institute who are very concerned with assurance of basically surgical procedures. And in their case, uh, they're thinking about these environments where you have a surgical suite, it's completely sensed, um, and it allows an AI to observe what's going on and perhaps, uh, perhaps help uh, the medical team uh, both sort of keep track of where they are in the procedure and avoid uh, uh, some of the more egregious problems that, uh, that keeps a, a surgeon awake nights, uh, things like wrong side surgery. Uh, there's been an enormous amount that we've learned uh, from those particular interactions. Uh, in particular, uh, they really sort of frame the problem of the AI needing to understand uh, not just what the humans are doing instantaneously, but where they are in a larger procedural sense. Uh, what are they trying to accomplish? Uh, are they doing the right step at the right time? Uh, and also cognitively, uh, are the humans in some way impaired? Is uh, one of the people in the room exhausted? Uh, are the communications between the individuals uh, being acknowledged? Uh, did the nurse understand what the surgeon said? So these have, I think, enormous implications, of course, for the space environment. So here you map it into space. Um, you know, we have the Dragonfly mission, which certainly is at one extreme of self-reliant systems. Um, you have, uh, you have uh, habitats in space for humans, which uh, presumably are fairly pervasively sensed uh, and which uh, are going to have computation. And in between, of course, you have this environment where we're going to expect to see humans interacting with robotic systems to accomplish specific tasks. And you have to expect that these are going to be uh, highly networked uh, networked environments. So I think these, these things map across pretty well. So let's just talk very briefly about the types of things that you might see going wrong with your fully autonomous system. Uh, you know, we think a lot about the complexities of the system operating 
in previous, previously unmapped uh, and poorly understood environments. Uh, but I'll just say that that you have uh, you have a range of problems which just have to do with the system understanding its own state. Um, so this this is a a, a data set from a vehicle uh, which suffered a unanticipated uh, fault, uh, which in fact was due to a shark attack. So a shark grabbed the vehicle, uh, shook it a bit, and, uh, and and in fact damaged an internal component, which caused the vehicle basically to ground itself uh, in Monterey Bay. Uh, the, the normal onboard systems weren't looking for that, didn't detect it. Um, but after the fact, uh, we were able to use some top, topic modeling based approaches, which basically understood, be, be developed an understanding of what nominal performance of the vehicle was and uh, could detect, in, in effect, the anomaly uh, caused by the internal failure of the vehicle very effectively, uh, literally within seconds. So. So these are the types of things that we think we're going to have important. So I'm getting close to the end there. Yeah, about two minutes. Thanks. Two minutes. Okay. So uh, another another area that I think that uh, we we've uh, we've become become more cognizant of interacting with the mental health folks is we actually know a lot uh, about how humans work with other humans. And so we have a variety of different ways of understanding uh, what a human's work characteristics are, how they like teaming with other people, uh, how to complement different people's skill sets. Uh, there's a whole industry on this. There's a whole literature on this. Uh, and let's just say that uh, this what we what we've been finding is we've been we've been having these conversations and doing little experiments is that these have implications for uh, for uh, uh, human uh, cognitive uh, AI machine uh, machine teaming as as well, uh, and we'll just say that that uh, one of the things that gives us hope here is the fact that in the mental health folks are doing a uh, 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 a lot of work on understanding human state through interaction, so through social media, through looking at uh, a wide variety of cues, including temporal patterns of, of interactions. Uh, and by the way, it is, as you apply this towards the space environment, it's worth noting in the aviation industry that, uh, that possibly the number one cause of large aircraft accidents is, uh, is pilots' uh, mental health. Uh, so depressed pilots basically uh, committing suicide uh, in, in, their, uh, in their aircraft. Uh, so there's a very real problem out there in the commercial environment with people that you would think of as normally very well trained. So these types of things give us the sense that you could actually use uh, uh, both understand sort of the nature of the human that you're interacting with and perhaps uh, understand uh, what uh, uh, what's going on with them in a particular moment. I'll just in a particular time at a particular task. I'll just say that we have funded a wide variety of different types of research activities within uh, the Institute for Assured Autonomy, uh, and I think many of these map into this environment here. And uh, in the interests of speed, I'll just jump straight to the final slide here and say that we're hiring. So we are actually looking for faculty for the Institute of Assured Autonomy. Um, those faculty members uh, in the past have been connected to our systems uh, folks, connected to the computer science de uh, uh, department, connected to ECE. In other words, that's where their uh, faculty appointment is. Uh, uh, and right now we're recruiting a faculty member who would uh, be partly mechanical engineering department and partly APL space sector hire. So, uh, so they receive bridging appointments. So I'll just say that if you're interested, contact us. Uh, we're excited uh, to, to move into this domain and, uh, and uh, uh, accelerate our um, collaboration here with APL space. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jim. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, so uh, I think we're we're still waiting for our last presenter to hop online. He said he would be here momentarily. Um, in the meantime, I kind of wanted to open things up. Um, oh, sorry, open things up to the Q and A. So we've been getting a couple questions in, and uh, Alex and Ben, please uh, feel free to this, join the conversation. Um, one of the first questions up was um, 
How should computer vision algorithms be adapted to account for stark lighting contrast? So I know this is particularly an issue on the moon, having that, um, that really stark contrast of lighting, very, very light and very dark. Um, so if, if any of the three of you are able to hop on and answer that question, that would be great. Yeah, well, I'll do my best to answer. Um, <laughs> so there are some approaches that kind of just specifically um, um, adapt themselves to mm -hmm. low lighting. Like in the literature, you see people trying to do slam in the dark with very low lighting and um, um, other attempts that kind of um, uh, parallel what people do for underwater computer vision too. Um, but the truth is, is there's not, in my opinion, there's not really a great way to do it. Um, uh, to adapt computer vision for low lighting. Um, you can uh, maybe shine a flashlight in front of you or uh, maybe look, um, uh, maybe not in a traditional computer vision approach like directly in front of the vehicle, but maybe different angles. Um, but there's not really a great answer um, to my knowledge and uh, it's a very hard problem. So if you know, please tell us. The, what the solution is. Yeah, and I guess to, to add on to, to what Ben said, I mean, you can either try to um, address it um, like post image collection um, with some, as some kind of um, some kind of like uh, intensity equalization on the image itself, or you can um, try to uh, like train different models to specific lighting conditions. A real challenge is just that things can be so brittle to whatever they were trained on. Um, or even the different um, exposures that you're, you're expecting in some computer vision algorithm. An alternate approach is to try to modify the environment upstream of the camera. So like put it using other lights, as Ben mentioned, um, or maybe using some kind of um, fiducials or, or things that might be more tolerant or a lot of the system be more tolerant to the lighting changes just from the get go. And then your computer vision algorithms don't necessarily um, have the same, um, uh, same risk of failure. So would it be okay? Yeah, would it be okay if I jumped in and answered yeah, a few questions absolutely. in meeting chat? Please do. Yeah. So I saw one there that uh, that talked about uh, the statistics uh, that I've referred to from the Rand report about uh, about proving that your autonomous car is better than a human. Um, the problem there is that humans uh, humans actually are pretty good drivers from a fatality perspective. So uh, they have a 1.4. Uh, uh, fatal accidents per 100 million miles driven. So what that means is if you really want to statistically prove that your autonomous car is better than a human, you have to accumulate more than 100 million miles. And, and of course, if that's going to be the way that you demonstrate your systems, every time you change your software, you have to drive another multiple of that. So, so this, is, this is kind of the challenge, uh, if you will, uh, with uh, with comparing yourself to humans is that many of these tasks humans are very good, and uh, and and so we have to become a lot cleverer in breaking down the problem domain and understanding uh, understanding failure modes and demonstrating that specifically um, the capabilities of the system are better than humans in those individual spaces. So, uh, so the testing regimen turns out to be a really, really big part of this uh, on Earth as it is in space, if you will. <laughs> definitely, definitely agree. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, thank you, guys. Um, I think uh, I think our other presenter has come online, so we'll we'll flip over to that, and if we have some time. Um, afterwards, we'll answer some questions. Otherwise, I'll um, we'll collect them via Slido and via um, and via the chat, and make sure that those get out to you. Um, and if you're able to answer them and send them back, we can post them on our ELSIC uh, Confluence and website. So we'll uh, we'll flip over now to uh, Fernando. Are you online? Um, good and... morning. Yes. Good morning. Hello. Hi. Yeah. Yep. Sorry about that. I had a few issues with my computer and, and I'm here now. No, uh, no worries. Should that, uh, would you like me to just share my screen and uh, do through the presentation? Is, is yeah, uh, 
Yes, of course. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, Fernando's coming to us from NASA Stennis, and we'll be doing his presentation on autonomy technologies for systems of a moon base. So I'll let you go ahead and share screen. Um, let me see. Take it away. <laughs> of course. Uh, well, let's see. Let me go with this and see if this will work. And then, can you see my screen? Um, yes. It looks like you have the zoom up. So far, he's been very funny. Let me put on the presentation and. <laughs> uh, can you can you see my screen with the presentation? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes, we can. So I will. Uh, I will go ahead and go through this. So thanks for uh, having me. Um, let me put it in presentation mode. And um, slideshow. There we go. Can you see? Yep, looks great. Thanks. OK, well, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm going to try to be fast. I know we're short in time, and, and apologize for being delayed here. Uh, so I'm try just trying to give an, uh, uh, a sense of uh, um, you know what? What I think uh, would require uh, autonomous operations on the moon, and also a sense of what uh, we have been doing at Stennis Space Center, the Autonomous Systems Lab, uh, in developing the technologies to potentially enable uh, these autonomous operations in a way that we haven't really had to do before, right? Um, so uh, I'm not going to go through all of these, but I think we're always looking at you know trying to figure out what autonomous operations means, what an autonomous systems is. So I I will uh, I think there there are a few definitions there, but basically uh, for something to be autonomous, uh, you know needs uh, needs to be able to you know, to do two things, right? To be uh, aware of uh, its own um, resources to do the activities that it needs to do. And then whenever there are uh, uh, issues with whatever it's expected to be doing, then to have the ability to, to mitigate those issues and hopefully continue with the mission. But so I, I'll, I'll leave this, uh, there's there are two slides in the beginning here, and, and you know folks can go and look through that at the various definitions. But uh, I, I would say one of the things that um, I tend to emphasize is that um, how you implement autonomy is important. And I think there are two ways to do that. And the way that is classically done is what I call brute force autonomy, where you have to basically solve the autonomy problems offline by experts and then just program the cases and solutions. And that's primarily what they've been doing. And it's very it's a, it's a prescriptive, prescriptive, right? Uh, the other way is to 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 do the what I want to call um, yeah, I call thinking autonomy. That it's you know it's model based, and the idea is to bring on board the ability to uh, first of all the knowledge and the ability to use that that knowledge in order to operate autonomously. And, and so I'll, I'll go forward with sort of a schematic of what. Uh, is what I what I call thinking autonomy, and it's the idea of having a system to be able to think on board on its own, right? And I guess it, the the thought is a little bit more comprehensive than just intelligence, right? Because it includes what's called an intellect system, as well as other systems that have to be involved in the overall thought process. Uh, whereby then you have a system that's very capable for very capable of doing things like analysis, uh, reasoning, decision making, and so on and so forth. Uh, this is a kind of a philosophical view of what thinking means, right? And in the work that we've been doing, we've been trying to go toward this this goal, toward this objective. And so you would like, you know, basically systems on the moon to 
to be able to think in the end. Uh, this is the work, this is uh, NPAS. NPAS is the, the, the NASA platform for autonomous systems is the project. And the, uh, what we've been, and, and it's also a, a software platform, right? And uh, the way this platform was designed is in fact, uh, as a platform to be used for implementing autonomy capabilities in uh, any any type of systems or, or a wide range of systems, uh, being electrical, mechanical. So to be able to encompass uh, or absorb or describe systems that uh, would be systems that uh, you know would be used anywhere, and especially on the moon surface. So the plat the platform is this here in this in this sort of a brownish background box, and so. Uh, you can you can you can any system application can be described inside the platform through some tools and and what you create is here what we call uh, an application knowledge domain model which is it is it, it's a um, uh, a uh, what do you call this uh, a description that's very very detailed about the system and its components. So it's a digital twin basically, but it's a live digital twin that's used for operations, right? On the right side, you have a mission. So what is this system gonna do? So we have tools to create the, the mission capability that includes, you know, uh, plan schedules and the executions of those. And these other boxes are the integrated system health management strategies box whereby you are able a, a city there this is this is very reusable capability of knowledge that allows uh, um, fault management basically and then autonomy strategies which allows autonomous with autonomous uh, dealing autonomously with with uh, issues and to mitigate issues that may happen right uh, can also create graphical user interfaces of course and also has bridges so that any application that's an NPAS application is basically a network application that can communicate through the network to, uh, uh, you know, to get the data that's coming from the actual system and to also command the system or, or manage the system through the, through the net, through network communications, right? Uh, and so you can also envision that this would be you could, you know, a, a network capability, and you have, you can implement multiple applications, and and implement a distributed network of autonomous systems using using this platform, right? Um, and uh, so, uh, going a little bit further on what I said that you you we have tools and impasse to create a digital twin. You can this is an example, right? So. Uh, here you can see in the images, the top is the actual schematic. So one of the things we do with digital twins is we go all the way to schematics because you generally would want to be able to reason about anything that's in the schematic, be it you know, in fluid systems, be it a pipe, a pump, a valve, or a sensor, all of those things or tanks, right? The same thing for electrical systems. So this is just an example of, of uh, and a project that we did at Kennedy Space Center. This is a schematic of a cryogenic test laboratory where we did a demonstration of an autonomous uh, um, transfer of fluid from a, from a storage tank to a flight tank. This is the representation within NPAS, right? And you can obviously use it to visualize. So the idea is that this is actually code and you can you, know, you can click on any of the elements that are here and see uh, the tables that uh, about describing what is that. If it's a sensor, it will show the name, the, the class to which it corresponds, all of the attributes, including attributes related to health, right? So digital twins and then pass. We represent uh, ontolo the ontological uh, structure, I guess, or, or infrastructure. Uh, of the of the system, topological. You can see here topological. So when you when you have the digital twin and you look at this, 
within NPAS, there is already a knowledge base that knows what's connected to what. And it has also code to be able to determine flow paths and other types of uh, sort of uh, concepts that are used for reasoning, right? And it's dynamic because the the uh, if you if you change position uh, of, of valves or state of valves, for example, immediately dynamically, it can show you what happened because it's a live digital twin. Um, and of course, uh, there is. Uh, uh, software behind it that you know, represents the models that are used for for reasoning, for analysis, and for decision making, right? Uh, to give you a little bit uh, uh, a sense of what it is, what we create when we do a digital twin, you know, we, I, I go back to SysML, uh, which is the language that's used for creating, uh, you know, com complete descriptions of systems, right? And so it, you, you can create uh, through structural diagrams, provide information or create uh, information about the structure of a system, but also behavior, right? And in NPAS, the structural model, we go all the way to the schematic level for topology and behavior capture. And on the behavior level, of course, we have uh, capabilities for uh, encompassing uh, fault management as well as autonomy. About one minute. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, talk briefly one minute uh, that we also have capabilities here for cause effect diagrams for including FEMIAs and it's very generic. It, it, what you see here is code and this code uh, exactly describes what you include in the FEMIAs and can be associated with the uh, military standard of FEMIAs, if you would like to describe it that way. But for example, quickly, this is an event that's called leak. It happens on this type of a system that's uh, uh, isolated subsystem. Uh, if a leak happens, any subcomponent that's in that uh, subsystem that's in, uh, that's isolated will be suspect of leak. The same thing, the, the, the isolation valves will be suspect, suspect of leak. So all I want for you to look at here is to see that this is code is a graphical code and I can capture in very, uh, very good detail what would be a FEMIA. And then in real time, uh, you know, this is more FEMIAs. And then in real time, you can, you know, you, you can create in real, the, the generic FEMIA when an event happens on, on a specific object, it creates a specific FEMIA that tells you what is what's failed, what is suspect, and so on and so forth. So it can do the diagnostics and the effects. And what's shown here is actually, again, this is different. This is a the electrical power system of, of Orion. Um, this is the digital twin in NPAS. And you can see that uh, NPAS is, you know, is, is driving, I guess, is managing the, the actual uh, um, power system. In this case, it was a simulation. Uh, this is the digital twin where you can have visibility as to what's happening. When an event happens, it goes into a, um, a cause-effect diagram. And then for a specific element, it creates its own cause-effect diagram. I'm going to stop there because I'm sure there's more questions. I will share the presentation so that you can go further and, and see more, more capabilities that, that we have. So anyway. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wonderful presentation. And uh, yes, to that point, we'll be asking all the presenters if they're um, able and comfortable with uh, sharing their presentations and we'll post them online with Confluence um, when uh, ap after the workshop is over. So uh, thank you so much to all the presenters. In the interest of time, um, if you could please put all of your questions onto Slido, we'll try to get them out and then get answers to those. Um, and uh, in the meantime, Christina, if you want to hit the slides again, uh, we have another lunch poll for you all. Uh, I believe this one has two questions on it. Um, yes, awesome. Thank you. Uh, so if you're able to uh, hop on there and answer those questions real quick, you have an hour for lunch um, or a little less than an hour. So we'll see you all back here at 1245. And thank you very much. Um...
Thank you. Uh, I hope you all had a great lunch. So um, at this point, I think we'll switch on to our uh, networking discussions. Uh, Christina, if you have that slide available, um, or I can share it as well. But in the meantime, Alhassan, if you want to introduce the, the next breakouts, please go ahead. OK, um, we'll have two breakout rooms, um, three. Uh, for both of the breakout rooms, there will be three Zoom um, uh, sessions that you can attend. Um, so the first breakout room will be situational and self-awareness. Um, it has to do more with environmental, situational, and self-awareness. And then the second breakout room will be reasoning and, act, and acting, so trust um, in, in these systems. And this has to do more with the logic and reasoning and human interactions with autonomous uh, systems itself. Um, here are the six Zoom uh, rooms, um, and you can see they're breaking up into two uh, sections. One is the situational and self-awareness, and then the reasoning and acting for the second. Um, the subject matter experts um, will be Tom, myself, uh, Terry, John, Bob, and Matt, and then we'll have uh, and Julie, and then we'll have facilitators um, also present there. Um, so as we uh, go through the the breakout rooms itself, um, please keep in mind the the different sessions. You can enter different rooms um, as you feel as you see fit. The conversations will be very interesting. Um, we did it this way so it's easier to have small groups that can get into depth um, with the different topics itself. Um, with that said, uh, let us start with uh, breakout rooms. Uh, so you should see, you should be able to um, see the breakout rooms at the bottom of your screen, if yep. I'm not mistaken, correct? So, um, so we're gonna just open up the six breakout rooms and you'll be all randomly distributed into them. If you would like to join the opposite breakout, just flip yourself into either rooms one, two, and three, and or four, five, and six, depending on which one you'd like to join. Um, if, oh goodness, sorry. Uh, um, yeah, so uh, logistically, we're just going to enter. Your facilitators will send you links to Miro boards, which we'll be using to collect information. If you haven't experienced Miro boards yet, that's fine. Your facilitator will be able to explain those. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, feel free to direct message me or any other uh, co-host, and we'll, we'll get you to the right place. So with that said, Kartina, are you able to start the breakouts? Awesome. Cool. See you all on the other side. <laughs>